Hello again, this is Rich Troxler, a.k.a. Rich Trox. I've been fishing striped bass for more than 40 years, and I've seen the bad times and I've seen the good. In recent years, there have been endless arguments on discussion boards and social media on the health of the Atlantic striped bass stocks. So I'm going to try and lend a little clarity to the subject and give you a few things to think about, as always, from the top down. Let me start by saying that the conclusions arrived on at this video will be based on available data and not on my own personal experiences. I may reference a personal experience from time to time, but I won't make any conclusions based on them. A single fisherman's experience does not count as data. However, the experiences of 100,000 fishermen does. So if you caught more bass in 2017 than you did in 2016, that's not an indicator of the overall health of the stocks. Much of the data used in this video comes from the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, otherwise known as the ASMFC. They are the ones that make the rules in this neck of the woods, and if you want to know more about them, there is plenty of information just to click away on the internet. I'll save everybody the suspense and say right off the bat that I have some issues with the way the ASMFC manages resources, starting with their bureaucratic mindset on down to their data collection and management methodologies. But they have a big job, and one that's not easy to do. This video will be presented in three parts. In part one, we'll look at some of the readily available data and how to interpret the information. In part two, we'll go back and take a look at the data again from a different perspective. And in part three, I'll summarize how I interpret the collective data and what it means to the stocks. I'll be moving quickly, so feel free to pause the video at any time to take a longer look at the data. Before we start looking at data, there are a couple of terms you should be familiar with. The first are the letters SSB. These stand for spawning stock biomass, aka coastal migratory stock, which is the total number of mature migrating fish. The other is the letter F. This represents fishing mortality, which is the number of fish that die. And for those who don't know, here's the quick skinny on the striped bass. They are long-lived fish that migrate north and south seasonally and go up rivers to spawn in the spring. Females start producing eggs at around six years of age and males can start fertilizing them around two years of age. The eggs hatch in coastal sounds and estuaries where they remain for two to four years before joining the coastal migratory population in the Atlantic Ocean. The migratory stock winters offshore in the ocean, mostly between New Jersey and North Carolina, and then move into the rivers to spawn in the spring. The coastal migratory stock is roughly made up of 75% Chesapeake Bay fish and 25% Hudson and Delaware River fish. Now let's look at some readily available data. This first chart is from the ASMFC website and is part of an overview of the 2016 stock assessment. It shows commercial landings and discards and recreational landings and release mortality. So let's take a look at how to read the chart and what the data tells us. The time axis runs along the bottom. The aforementioned landings and discards axis is on the left and is scaled in millions of fish. The key is in the upper left. The black line represents commercial landings and discards. The vertical green bar represents recreational landings. And just for information, the recreational sector includes all party boats, charter boats, private boats, shore fishermen, etc. The vertical blue bar represents the number of recreationally caught fish that die after being released. Note that recreational release mortality figures assume that 9% of fish released alive will die. In the process of making this video, I've read through hundreds of pages of documentation, and I will say that deciphering information from ASMFC publications can be very confusing at times. For instance, in this chart, the green bar in the key is labeled recreational landings, and the data used to represent this comes from a table entry in the stock assessment labeled recreational harvest. And the blue bar in the key is labeled recreational release mortality. And the data used to represent this comes from a table entry in the stock assessment labeled recreational discards. Yet on the same table, you have recreational harvest, but commercial landings. Don't commercial fishermen harvest the resource? These inconsistencies in nomenclature can be misleading, as most fishermen would consider a harvested fish as one taken out of the biomass, and a landed or caught fish as one that was brought to the net and either harvested or released. And the information that is associated with this chart adds to the confusion. If you skip the first paragraph, you'll notice that the first couple of sentences use the terms landings and harvested, and they are referenced in pounds. 
Seeing as the chart is scaled in millions of fish, there is no visible point of reference for this data. Then there is the original question of what is the difference between landing and harvesting. So I read through the paragraph and I get to the last three sentences. At that point, they finally decide to shift to millions of fish, and initially the numbers seem to be way off and not consistent with any data on the chart, which is in millions of fish and not tens of millions. The first sentence references recreational release data in 2006 as 23.3 million fish. So I go off and look up the original stock assessment for 2006 to verify the figures. After initially struggling a bit with the nomenclature, I determined that for the year 2006, the data in the assessment table for recreational harvests matches the data in the 2016 chart for recreational landings, and that the data from the table for recreational discards matches the data in the chart for recreational release mortality. At this point, I have at least established what the data in the chart represents, but what really amazes me is that nothing mentioned in the associated text has anything to do with the data represented on this chart. So what does this chart actually tell us? Well, after getting past the inconsistencies in nomenclature and disconnected text, this chart represents how many fish the recreational sector harvests, how many recreationally caught fish die after release, and how many fish the commercial sector harvests and discards as dead. It's basically a breakdown of our collective footprint on the resource, a minus column in the grand scheme of things. A quick scan shows that the period between 85 and 87 had set the low water mark for recreational and commercial harvest and mortality. And if you plot out the recreational harvest data between 1994 and 2006, the trend line would show a steady increase, while doing the same for the period between 2006 and 2016 would show a steady decrease. And lastly, plotting commercial harvests and discards for the period between the late 90s up to 2014 would yield a fairly level trend line. Commercial fishermen work on a quota system, so this is not surprising. The next chart shows female spawning stock biomass and young of the year recruitment. The ASMFC considers both of these to be important metrics, particularly young of the year recruitment, and rightfully so. So again, let's take a look at how to read the chart and what the data tells us. As in the previous chart, the time axis runs along the bottom. The left axis is female spawning stock biomass, expressed in millions of pounds as opposed to millions of fish, most probably because of the ratio of fish weight to number of eggs produced. And the right axis is young of the year recruitment, expressed in millions of age one fish. These are fish that if they survive will be added to the biomass down the road. The key is in the bottom right. The solid yellow line represents age one recruitment and is associated with the axis to the right. The solid green line represents female SSB target and is associated with the axis to the left. This is the level that the ASMFC attempts to manage to. The dotted green line represents female SSB threshold and is also associated with the axis to the left. This is the level where the ASMFC theoretically considers taking action in order to avoid loss of sustainability. And lastly, the solid blue area represents female SSB and once again is associated with the axis to the left. This is the total weight of all the female breeders in the biomass. So what does this chart show? Starting with the yellow line representing young of the year recruitment, it shows a historic high of roughly 180 million fish around the year 1994 with another spike around 2004 and several lesser spikes sprinkled in. However, there were more down years than up. A while back I made an Excel spreadsheet on this data that plotted a trend line, but I can't find it now and I'm too busy to recreate it. But the trend line looks something like this. Not exact, but close enough to see that despite the spikes, the overall age one recruitment has been trending down for years. It should be noted that age one recruitment is not the same as nor should be confused with SSB recruitment. I'll be talking more about both later on. This chart also shows that female SSB had only reached target SSB for around four years between 2002 and 2006, and has been in decline ever since, and now nears the SSB threshold. This is another downward trend. Now let's look at the stock status information associated with the chart. To me, these few paragraphs paint a strange picture of the manner in which the ASMFC views the resource. The first sentence is their catch-all opener that every document of theirs begins with. It states that the resource is not overfished or is experienced overfishing relative to the biological reference points. 
I'll be talking more about these reference points later on. The next sentence starts by repeating the pitch about the stocks not being overfished, but goes on to say that female SSB has been declining for over a decade and is now approaching threshold. Then you're told that mortality is below the target. I will also be discussing mortality target levels later on. The next paragraph opens with more sugar stating that despite the declines in SSB, meaning the fully recruited coastal-wide spawning stock biomass, not just female SSB, that we're not as bad off as during the crash of the 80s. The following sentence switches back to age one recruitment stating it grew for a period of time and then declined, and again, not as bad as the 80s crash. To me, the repeated references to the 80s crash are irrelevant and kind of defensive sounding, and the fact that they are even using that as a comparison point should tell you that something is wrong. The last paragraph states that if catch, which really should read mortality, remains constant, then there is a 39% chance of SSB, meaning the fully recruited coastal-wide spawning stock biomass, falling below threshold, etc., etc., etc. So despite the rhetoric and the confusing manner in which the information is provided, the message I get here is that there appears to be problems, but that they are not related to overfishing. And speaking of total SSB, I could not find any chart or graph that represents actual estimated numbers of total SSB, which is the total amount of recruited striped bass in the Atlantic coastal stock. The best I could find was a chart based on relative abundance from the MRFSS and a table of indices from several sources who provide data to the ASMFC. I took the liberty of generating a chart based on the indices from the MRIP column just to get another visual reference. These charts are not scaled in actual numbers of fish, they are just scaled on indices based on the estimated numbers of fish. Both show pretty much the same thing. A steady increase in abundance to around the year 2000, and a steady decrease from then until the present, with a singular spike around 2005 or thereabouts. I also found this paragraph in an update to the 2016 stock assessment that gave some abundance numbers. But again, it shouldn't be confused with total SSB as it pertains to the fully recruited migratory coastal stock, because it includes one plus year old fish. Striped bass typically don't leave their spawning areas and join the ranks of the coastal migratory stock until they're several years old, and they have slightly less than a 50% chance of surviving long enough to do so. The first two charts from the ASMFC 2016 overview summarize certain data sets for the Atlantic striped bass biomass. As mentioned previously, the total Atlantic striped bass biomass is made up of roughly 75% Chesapeake fish and 25% Hudson and Delaware River fish, with the Hudson stock making up the lion's share of that 25%. As the Chesapeake Bay stock makes up the major portion of the total stock, let's take a closer look at how it fits into the big picture. This first chart shows the juvenile striped bass index for the Maryland portion of Chesapeake Bay. I won't go into detail about how they gather this data other than to say that they typically perform a series of trawls and or seine netting several times a year using the same size nets and trawling or netting the same sample areas. These provide the spatial and temporal components of the index. There is plenty more information on the internet about the process for those who want to know more. This chart is different from the 2016 overview charts because it doesn't deal in specific numbers, it just deals in means. The object of the exercise is to use averages to establish an index with which to make comparisons against. Just to avoid confusion, the word mean and the word average are interchangeable in the context of this discussion. So the vertical index axis on the left is in increments of 10, and while the index reference could be in thousands or millions, it doesn't really matter, because only indices based on averages are being represented here, not specific quantities. The horizontal time axis should need no explanation at this point. Each blue bar basically represents the average of all sample collection data for that year. Here is a really simplified version of how the process works. For this example, let's assume the yearly index is based on one sampling period over a total of 10 sampling areas. At each sampling area, a trawl is performed with a specific size net over the specified area at the specified time of year, and the juvenile fish in the net are counted and the number recorded in a log. After all 10 areas have been sampled, the total number of juvenile fish is averaged, and that is what is represented by the vertical blue bar on the chart. To give you an idea of some actual numbers and scope of the process, here is data from the VIMS SANE survey program, one of several monitoring programs involved in collecting data in the Bay. 
Going back to the chart, the solid black horizontal line represents the mean of a predefined reference period. For instance, in Virginia, they used the period between the years 1980 and 2009. The juvenile striped bass indices from Maryland and Virginia are important management metrics used in making projections for biomass recruitment. So what do they actually tell us? Well, this chart certainly shows that the period of the mid-80s set historic lows for this particular metric in Maryland waters. It also shows that 1996 set the historic high water mark. A quick scan of recent history shows that the years 2001 and 2011 also had fairly high index ratings, with 2003 and 2015 being about double the mean. It's interesting to note that several of the high index years are followed by a year of extremely low index. Not exactly sure why this happens or what it means. No pun intended. Here's another chart showing the Virginia Juvenile Striped Bass Index. It's set up the same way as the Maryland chart, but the datum is displayed a little differently. It's interesting to note that the mean lines are of different values for the two states, and I'll talk about this in a bit. But for now, what you'll notice is that the data points on this chart roughly track the data points in the Maryland chart, but they also have some differences. Both charts show very high indices for 1996 and again in 2011, followed by record low indices for 2012. And both show at least one fairly high index around the turn of the century, but the years are different. And lastly, both show clusters of low and lower index years. The juvenile index for the entire bay consists of the average of both indices, but the variance in data points between these two charts is important because it could be an indicator of favorable or unfavorable conditions for breeding. While not the major contributor, the Hudson River stock makes up 20-something percent of the total SSB, which is still significant. Here is the chart for their Young of the Year Abundance Index. Unlike Virginia and Maryland's average production-based mean, New York measures their indices based against a failure level, which is represented by the horizontal red line. As a former resident of Long Island, the first thing that jumps out at me on this chart is the four consecutive high indices between the years 87 and 90, along with the lesser four-year cluster between 92 and 95. There's no doubt that those year classes were the basis for the great fishing we experienced along the coast of Long Island in the mid-90s and into the turn of the century, as well as playing a significant role in rebuilding the total SSB after the 80s crash. But as important as all this information is, I will say that in my opinion, making judgments based solely on indices and or means is a slippery slope, and this is why. Going back to the Maryland Juvenile Index chart, the mean, as represented by the solid black line, may be from a predefined sample period. As stated earlier, in Virginia, they used the fixed period between years 1980 and 2009 to establish their mean. While I'm sure this is not arbitrary and does reflect some historic highs and low, it is still a soft reference point for what people should consider average. And by soft, I mean movable, not the Java programming language definition. For instance, if you move the beginning of the sample period back to 1973 and the end of the sample period ahead to 2010, then this would lower your mean line, making the year indices look better when compared to that mean. Conversely, moving the beginning of the sample period forward to 1989 and the end of the sample period ahead to 2011 would move your mean line much higher, making the majority of the year indices well below mean. And if your data accumulates yearly from a fixed point in time, a progressive series of low yearly indices will progressively lower your mean line and vice versa. All of these factors can skew or obscure reality. So if the defined sample period produces a low mean, then being average doesn't necessarily equate to being good. Here's an example of how information like this can be misleading. This is an excerpt from a newspaper in Williamsburg. Here's the headline. Note the date and that the author is Staff VIMS, which stands for Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which lends credibility to the information. You can pause the video and read the article if you like, but basically it says the Chesapeake has produced an average year class of juvenile fish and that the past four years have also been average as compared to the historical index. But the kicker is the last statement which reads, although variation in striped bass recruitment among years can be considerable, the average indices observed in recent years may indicate greater consistency in the production of juvenile fish than what was observed in the past. This is what I'm talking about. The general tenor of the article is upbeat and positive. Oh look, we're average. But if I discard the rhetoric and look at all the data, as a whole this is what I see. 
I see declining stocks, declining female breeders almost at threshold, many years of trended down recruitment, increased mortality in proportion to numbers of fish caught, continued pressure on the stock, and a juvenile recruitment mean that apparently isn't producing sustainability. The fishery has been living on the occasional large spike, so consistency with the mean in this case is not really a good thing. And I haven't even brought microbacteriosis into the discussion yet, so let's get to that. Mycobacteriosis, which I'll be referring to as myco from here on in, is the 800-pound gorilla in the striped bass management room. While there are some studies being conducted, it continues to be treated like a red-headed stepchild, with little acknowledgement given or reasonable accounting of its impact provided by the ASMFC, at least from what I can see. So what exactly is myco? Here are some excerpts from an article in the Bay Journal from back in 2004. Feel free to pause at will, and yes, I picked this date for a reason. Besides the description, the most interesting thing in this paragraph is the statement that says it had never been seen in the wild on the East Coast until 1997. Translated, this means it's uncharted territory with no historical data to draw from. This next set of paragraphs is also interesting. The first paragraph cites a multi-agency study that indicated that well over 50% of the Chesapeake population was infected with myco. The second paragraph indicated the rate of infection was climbing, with disease rates getting progressively higher as the fish get older. And the third paragraph closes by saying that the disease could take many years to take its toll. The article goes on to cite studies that indicate striped bass survival in the Chesapeake Bay has decreased from 70% to 50% and that myco is the likely cause. Just for clarity, when reading the third paragraph, remember that he is referencing the catch rate in the bay, not coastal-wide, which had significantly increased from the previous years. The last paragraph goes on to state that a similar analysis was performed by another scientist which showed the same results, and that both of these scientists are on committees that provide information to the ASMFC. When the ASMFC was contacted regarding these studies, they indicated that their tagging data showed the same results, but they didn't appear to consider myco as a possible reason. I found the last sentence to be interesting and revealing, but you can judge what it means for yourself. Here is some more information from a study conducted by the Virginia Institute for Marine Sciences. I attended a seminar given by the ASMFC several years back. The speaker covered several topics, including a breakdown on projected striped bass mortality, which was presented in the form of a pie chart showing the various sources of mortality, such as recreational discards, commercial discards, poaching, natural causes, etc. I don't remember the exact breakdown, but natural mortality was a relatively small sliver in the pie. Toward the end of the seminar, there was a QA and a period, and one of the attendees asked about myco. The speaker gave a brief description and some information that was basically the same as what you find on the internet. The short version being roughly 75% of the Chesapeake biomass are infected. A little while later, another attendee asked if myco was fatal, with the speaker confirming that it was believed to be fatal at some point. The seminar ended shortly after that, and while the speaker was packing up his stuff, I went over and asked him if he had time for a quick question. He said sure, so I opened the pamphlet to the page with the projected mortality pie chart and asked where Myco was represented in the pie chart. He said, what do you mean? I said, if I understand correctly, the total Atlantic biomass is made up of 75% Chesapeake Bay fish and 25% Hudson fish. So if 75% of the Chesapeake stock is infected with myco and the Chesapeake stock makes up 75% of the biomass and myco is ultimately fatal, then that should mean that roughly 50% of the total Atlantic biomass should die from myco, yes? So where is this represented on the pie chart? He glanced at the chart and gave me a hmm, interesting, and promised to take it up with his boss when he got back. In the 2013 benchmark assessment, I could only find one small paragraph on the impact of myco on the bass stocks. The ASMFC doesn't talk about it much, and I find that both... As stated earlier, the total number of pages of information that make up stock assessments and their supporting documents is massive. But at the end of the day, the data taking, manipulation, and modeling is all to provide a handful of management metrics and key indicators of stock health. In their stock assessment overviews, the ASMFC provides information on some of these metrics and indicators. Other pertinent information and data requires a little more looking. Due to my previous career training, I tend to focus on trends when I look at data. 
I also examine cause and effect relationships and root causes when making judgments and decisions. So let's go back and take a look at some of the data from a little different perspective. We'll start at the top by going back and looking at the data for the overall biomass. This relative abundance index from the 2013 benchmark assessment shows that the bass population peaked in the late 90s and has trended down through 2012. Based on recent data and from the 2016 assessment, indices for any subsequent years would not be enough to change the general trend line. Here is a summary from the 2016 assessment update. It should be noted that the initial statistics are for one-year-old fish and above. Successful spawning years can produce large quantities of young fish, but they also suffer a very high rate of mortality. Striped bass generally do not leave their spawning areas to join the coastal-wide SSB until their fourth year, and according to documentation, have less than a 50% chance of surviving long enough to do so. Halfway through the paragraph, they switch to eight-plus-year-old fish, and the figures drop dramatically. They track these fish separately because an 8-year-old fish is estimated to be 29 inches, meaning that it is now harvest-sized, based on the 28-inch recreational size limit enacted coastal-wide by Amendment 6. Here is a table that gives the breakdown by year and age. For the year 2015, the initial abundance figure of 180 million plus fish sounds like a lot. However, the estimated figure of 6.8 million for recruited and harvestable striped bass is quite a bit lower. Here is what the comparative charts look like, and note the index scales on both. If you trim the abundance data of 8 plus year old fish, this is what you get. Based on the data in this table, I did an analysis of age 1 to age 4 and age 1 to age 8 mortality rates, which you'll see in a bit. The results are very interesting. Now let's go back and look at the chart for commercial and recreational harvest and discards. As mentioned before, if you trend this data, it pretty much tracks the SSB stock abundance trends. This is logical and should come as no surprise. More fish, more catch. Less fish, less catch. This relationship is also assumed by the ASMFC. It shows a steady increase from the early 90s to a peak in 2006, and then a steady decline from 2006 to the present. To add a sense of scale to this discussion, I did some simple math. If you add the figures in the previous abundance table for 2015 age 4 and above fish, which basically represents the whole migratory coastal SSB, it comes to around 30 million fish. The data in this chart for the year 2015 indicates that approximately 2.1 million fish were taken out of the biomass by recreational harvest and discards, and another 900,000 or so by way of commercial harvest and discards. This totals around 3 million fish, or roughly one-tenth of the total migratory SSB. That's a fairly significant footprint, at least in my opinion. Next up is the chart for female SSB and age 1 recruitment. For the two metrics represented on this chart, both show downward trends for the past decade or more. Due to the large number of eggs a single mature female can produce, opinions are mixed on the importance of female SSB data as it relates to juvenile recruitment. However, being that they do represent a significant portion of the total SSB, their declining numbers still qualify as a downtrend when judging the health of the stocks. The backside of female SSB is age 1 recruitment, and this is an important metric. The simple truth is that you can't continually draw from a resource without replacing it. But the problem is we know precious little of the process. We lack a working understanding of what conditions lead to successful spawning and what factors lead to their mortality. So for now, predicting when successful year classes will happen and what percentage will ascend to the SSB is not really possible. The ASMFC basically operates on the assumption that if you have a lot of large successful year classes, then some percentage of those fish will survive long enough to recruit to the SSB. Conversely, no or low age 1 recruitment means no or very low recruitment to the SSB. In part 1 of this video, we looked at some young of the year recruitment data. We established that roughly 75% of the total SSB originates from Chesapeake Bay waters, so their juvenile recruitment is an important indicator of what the future holds. We also know, even under the best of conditions, nature doesn't do linear, so spikes and dips in juvenile abundance and mortality are to be expected. And then there's that slippery mean line to confuse perception. This is why trends are so important when interpreting this type of data.
If you disregard general or specific reasons for fecundity and mortality, this leaves you with two possible truth states. The first is that you don't know what kind of SSB recruitment rate you will get from any one large year class. The assumption is you will get some recruitment, but during the three to four years the juvenile fish spend on their spawning grounds, a host of ecological and biological factors can greatly influence mortality rate. So you just don't know for sure. They used to use a mortality rate of 30% when predicting juvenile to SSB recruitment, but data from a series of studies indicate that mortality has been steadily climbing over the last decade and is now over 50%. The second is that you do know what kind of SSB recruitment rate you will get from no or low year classes, basically little to none. So it's important to consider this when interpreting what this data means to the overall SSB recruitment. So with the hindsight that history provides us, we know that there was significant SSB recruitment from Maryland's monster year classes of 96 and 2001. These fish made up the bulk of the subsequent year's SSB and are the larger fish we've been catching and harvesting for the last decade and a half. We also know with history's hindsight that there was little to no SSB recruitment the following nine years of lower or poor year classes. The next good year class in Maryland was in 2011, followed by a decent year class in 2015. There was some SSB recruitment from the 2011 year class, and these are all the small fish that were prevalent along most ocean beaches this year. This was also indicated by the ASMFC. The impact to total SSB by the 2015 year class has yet to be determined because recruitment won't happen for another year or so. So in terms of trending this data, we see that during the recovery years from the mid-80s to 1996, that the good year classes trended up, and that the subpar year classes also trended up. But since the turn of the century, the good year classes have trended down, as have had the lesser and the subpar years, with 2014 the only lesser year class to buck the trend. In addition to the trends, there is also the duration factor to consider. During the rebuilding years, Maryland experienced three increasingly large year classes during a seven-year period. But since the turn of the century, there have only been four progressively smaller good year classes over a 17-year period, with a seven-year stretch of very low year classes thrown in. The equivalent data for Virginia waters, which covers less area but are closer to the ocean, paint a slightly different picture. Both show three increasingly larger year classes during the rebuilding period, but after the turn of the century, Virginia's three large year classes trend up, peaking in 2011, while showing two prolonged clusters of low abundance year classes. As a reminder, the solid black line is a mean, an average, not a target, threshold, or indicator of health. So aside from being a metric for predicting SSB recruitment, the differences in peak year classes between these two waters could provide valuable insight into why spawning is more successful in one area and less so in another. And just to be diligent, a quick look at the Hudson River Young of the Year Abundance Index shows that since 2007, the larger year classes have trended down, as have the lower year classes. So thus far, we've looked at the trends and data for total stock abundance, harvest and discards, and biomass recruitment. But there is one factor that influences all three of these elements, and that is the letter F, which in this discussion represents mortality. Through the use of tagging and reporting data, man's footprint on the total SSB can be calculated to a reasonable degree. Not exact, but close enough for management purposes. On the other hand, trying to calculate mortality from natural means is a whole different animal entirely. Factors that contribute to natural mortality are numerous and varied, and can include, but are not limited to, weather conditions, water conditions, predation, lack of forage, and disease. These factors can work alone or in combination to trigger increases in mortality. And the problem is that without the prerequisite knowledge required, it can be very difficult to predict their impact. And while the current knowledge base has developed the underpinnings of their impact, determining more precise levels of confidence has proven difficult for this one simple reason. Other than a mass die-off from asphyxiation or extreme cold, most natural mortality happens on a one-off basis, where the fish usually sinks to the bottom as consumed by crabs. This makes it near impossible to monitor or gather data in the wild, so many of the assumptions we have in relation to these factors are typically based on data gathered from laboratory simulations and studies, and these have proven helpful. Over the past decade or more, there have been many studies on the causes and impact of myco, also known as fish tuberculosis, but strangely not a lot of useful information on the internet. 
There are a lot of single page and short versions that basically parrot the same information we've seen already, or some PowerPoint slides from a meeting or presentation, but few comprehensive and well-presented studies, and a lot of it is from over a decade ago. It took a lot of digging before I found a published study that was really informative and relatively recent. But for now, let's look at some of the data and statistics associated with this disease. And just as a reminder, 75% of the total SSB originates from the Chesapeake Bay, and that these fish typically spend the first four years in the bay before they recruit to the coastal migratory SSB. The current information on MICO indicates that the SSB infection rate is about 75%. It was first detected in the Chesapeake Bay in 1997. It's a chronic progressive disease primarily affecting internal organs such as the spleen, liver, and kidneys. Some fish exhibit external symptoms such as scale loss, ulcerations, and pigment changes. MICO is irreversible, ultimately fatal, and has shown no sign of regression. And lastly, studies suggest that in the last decade or so, the mortality rate of pre-recruited Chesapeake Bay fish has increased significantly to over 50%. The aforementioned study had some very interesting information. This first chart shows prevalence of the disease by age. The vertical axis to the left is scaled in percentage. The horizontal axis is scaled in the year classes and labeled age. The sample size for each year class is also shown, where n equals the actual number of fish sampled. The data shows a steady increase in prevalence of the disease as the fish get older. It then drops off at around age 8, which if you remember from some previous data we looked at, is the age that fish make the transition to harvestable size fish. I mentioned the length component for a reason that I'll cover in my summary. The accompanying statement concludes by suggesting that the drop in disease prevalence at age 8 is due to disease mortality, which would be consistent with other information about the disease's progression and ultimate outcome. This next chart illustrates the previous chart information in a different way, but the assumptions drawn from it remain the same. This last chart shows the prevalence of the disease in Maryland striped bass over time. If you manage to get this far without falling asleep, then an explanation on how to read this chart should not be necessary. If you trend this data, the trend line would look something like this. This study also collected and correlated extensive data on environmental factors and how they relate to the spread of myco. Although I'm sure there are other studies, this is by far the most comprehensive assessment of this type data I could find on the internet, and it shows some very revealing correlations between specific environmental issues and the prevalence and infection rate of the disease. This is good news for any future enterprise tasked with controlling the spread of this disease. At this point, after weeks of research and poring over data, I'm getting a little burned out. So it's time for me to sum it all up and provide my conclusion. In the process, we'll be taking a little closer look at the ASMFC and how they manage the resource. So as always, let's start at the top. The quantitative management techniques used by the ASMFC generate volumes of data and statistics, which get plugged into various models in order to predict outcomes. These are the nuts and bolts of the machine, and trying to evaluate all of this collectively can be overwhelming to say the least. But in the case of striped bass management, all of that effort comes down to basically evaluating additions and subtractions to determine a given quantity. In simple terms, for each year, what was the total of all fish removed from the biomass and what were the additions? With the caveat being that due to the magnitude of the processes involved, the actual yearly figures are still best guess estimates. This is why looking at trends is so important. The calculations and processes that introduce variation or skew into final estimates tend to remain consistent year to year. So while the actual yearly values may not be precise, they will still produce a fairly accurate trend over time. And if you look at the trends of literally all key performance metrics for the stocks, they've all been in a downtrend since the turn of the century. And despite their stoic mantra stating that the stocks are not overfished nor experiencing overfishing, this is not escape notice by the ASMFC. At this point, feel free to pause the video and read the text because I'll be talking through it quickly. The ASMFC manages the resource through the Interstate Fisheries Management Plan. Changes to the plan are made through a series of amendments. Amendment 3 was implemented to protect the 1982 year class. Amendment 4 was implemented in 1989 in order to rebuild the stocks. Amendment 5 was implemented in 1995 to exploit the stocks, setting the F target as high as 0.4. 
The most recent amendment is Amendment 6, which was adopted in 2003 and replaced all previous plans. Amendment 6 retooled the methodologies, set new biological reference points and management triggers, and implemented a host of other changes. Addendums are used to make changes to amendments, and Amendment 6 has four thus far. Amendment 1, implemented in 2007, didn't change any reference points. Amendment 2, approved in 2010, established a new definition of recruitment failure, but didn't change any reference points. Addendum 3 was approved in 2012 and initiated a uniform commercial tagging program. Addendum 4 was approved in 2014 in response to the 2013 benchmark stock assessment, which indicated a steady decline in SSB since mid-2K. So let's take a look at how the ASMFC determines whether the stock is overfished or not and work our way in from there. This information comes from Draft Addendum 4 to Amendment 6. This paragraph defines the biological reference points that are used to determine if the stock is overfished or not. The first biological reference point is based on F, which I'm sure you know by now represents mortality. Whatever the process by which they establish this reference point, the end result sets a threshold value of F which corresponds to the maximum sustainable yield. Maximum sustainable yield is the most you can take out of the stock without negatively impacting the ability of the stock to replace itself. By default, this is managing the resource on a knife's edge. It would be easy for me to get judgmental about their management goals at this point, but the truth is the ASMFC is funded through a combination of member state dues and state and federal grants, which means that the ASMFC doesn't really determine the agendas. The agendas are handed down to them. Because of the large economic impact of coastal fisheries, they no doubt receive pressure from all directions to produce results that meet those agendas. Basically, they're just a bunch of mathematicians and project managers, and I wouldn't be surprised if most of them don't even fish. So the short vision is that they really don't have a dog in the race other than keeping their jobs, but I digress. The second reference point is based on SSB, with the threshold value equal to the SSB from the year 1995, the year the stocks were declared rebuilt. As near as I can tell, they've utilized biological reference points since 1989 when Amendment 4 allowed states to reopen the fishery under a target F of 0.25, which at that time was half the estimated target F of 0.5, not threshold target mortality needed to achieve maximum sustainable yield. So the short version of this paragraph is that the ASMFC is acknowledging that the value for F based on maximum sustainable yield is not maintaining SSB at 1995 levels, and that despite total mortality always being maintained below target mortality as set by the biological reference points, the SSB has continued its long decline toward threshold. As a result, the 2013 benchmark assessment recommended changes to the biological reference generation process that would result in lowering the value of F, meaning lowering the harvest. So what can we infer from this? Well, for starters, regardless of the data they base it on or the methods used to generate it, both biological reference points are assigned values, values that are assumed to produce an expected or desired result. By default, the use of assigned values when attempting to model large dynamic environments invites error. Going back to the juvenile recruitment data, I pointed out that there were significant uptrends in the year class abundance during the rebuilding years from both the Chesapeake and the Hudson stocks, perfectly coordinated and in a relatively short period of time. Coupled with a higher survival rate due to the lack of MICO at the time and the subsequent higher rate of recruitment to the SSB, they produced a historic high abundance of harvestable fish that extended well past 1995 and into the turn of the century. And instead of recognizing that they had benefited from the perfect storm of recruitment, the ASMFC considered it normal and predictable and used the data from that time as the basis for their biological reference points. This is where the skew originates and the problems begin. The result is that the ASMFC allowed us to harvest the hell out of the stocks with the combined commercial and recreational harvest peaking around the years 2005 and 2006. To give you an idea of the scale and impact of these actions, in 2006, 
Commercial harvest and discards totaled 1.249 million fish, and the recreational harvest and discards totaled 4.889 million fish. The combined total is 6.14 million fish, which almost equals the 6.82 million harvest-sized fish nine years later in 2015. That's an F value of 0.9. At that time, the value of the biological reference points for F target, not threshold, but target, was set to 0.3, and it was even higher previously at 0.5. Is that a lot? You can decide for yourself. Was the stock being overfished? Not according to the biological reference points. And even though the downtrends started revealing themselves just after the turn of the century, it didn't seem to matter, because despite the unabated downtrends, the ASMFC continued to manage the resource to maximum yield, guided by their biological reference points, which indicated that it wasn't being overfished. And even as recently as 2010, in response to external economic pressures, the ASMFC proposed opening up the EEZ for harvest to the commercial sector. But that was fortunately nixed by NOAA, who holds sway on matters in federal waters. And this was not the first time they had made this proposal. The ASMFC has a long laundry list of proposals stretching back almost two decades aimed at increasing harvest, most recently a proposed 10% increase in harvest in 2018, which got voted down, all justified by their biological reference points. Such are the perils of managing for maximum sustainable yield. So what this paragraph shows is that it took until the 2013 benchmark stock assessment to kick them into action. To illustrate the impact, if you assign much lower threshold values for F for the last 12 years or so, then it would have shown that the stocks were being overfished for all of those years. I'm not saying they should or shouldn't have done this, I'm just showing the effect it would have had. This conclusion is evident in this paragraph summarizing the various harvest reduction scenarios suggested to reduce mortality to the new F level. It states that regardless of the harvest reduction scenario, that SSB will likely fall below threshold for a couple of years because of the lack of strong year classes in the fishery, before starting to trend back up based on the 2011 year class fish recruiting into the SSB in 2015 and 2016. Seeing as this was written in 2013, we have the benefit of hindsight in checking the prediction made in the previous paragraph's last sentence regarding the 2011 year class. Looking at the chart from the 2016 assessment on stock abundance by age, it does show an increase of 3 million age 4 fish in 2015. This represents an increase of roughly 25%, and even though age 8 and above abundance continues its decline, was the primary reason for the increase in abundance of the age 4 and above fish that constitute the SSB. And as I just mentioned a short while ago, the ASMFC was already looking to tap into this by proposing a 10% increase in harvest for 2018. They are relentless. I'll touch on the 2011 year class and what it means to the future of the fishery very soon. So far we've established that the ASMFC attempts to manage the resource to maximum sustainable yield and that the process by which they establish their biological reference points has contributed to the long decline in stocks. As I alluded to before, modeling large dynamic environments involves massive amounts of data from many sources, as well as computer models that accurately reflect those environments. In enterprises such as this, error and skew are almost impossible to eliminate, and as we've already seen, can produce dramatic results. I know I'm editorializing a bit here, but if an organization is tasked with managing a resource to maximum sustainable yield, then that organization should make sure that its models are robust, its process is sound, and its data is accurate. Maximum yield doesn't leave much room for error, so here are a few more interesting tidbits I found as incidental bycatch during my research. I've eliminated the identity info from this one, but basically it's a letter from an associate to a higher up regarding the lack of accuracy of a computer model called ADAPT, which was, and maybe still is, a key component used in assessing the stocks. It goes on to delineate the issues and then states that due to the shortcomings of ADAPT that the SCAM model has recently been proposed to replace it. On a humorous note, that's a pretty odd acronym for computer modeling software that is supposed to be delivering accurate results. Here's an example of a gray area in data for the minus column. This is from the 2017 update to the 2016 stock assessment, and the only pertinent sentence is the last one. 
After summarizing commercial data, the paragraph concludes by pointing out that it should be noted that commercial discards are figured by the ratio of recreational tags returned to commercial tags returned, and that commercial discards continue to be the source of uncertainty in stock assessment. I found several other documents that suggested commercial discards were suspected of being much higher than reported. Here's another example of a gray area in data but this time for the plus column. And again, it's the last sentence that is pertinent. It states that their computer model estimated that 2015 age one abundance was expected to be large. However, recruitment estimates in the terminal year of the model tend to be highly uncertain, with the operative word being highly. I take this to be at least a partial nod to the impact of MICO on the stocks. There are a lot of sources of mortality for juvenile fish, such as predation, but the recent narratives indicate that spawn to recruitment success rate has dropped steadily from around 70% to slightly less than 50% in recent years. This might explain why recruitment estimates are considered highly uncertain, or it could just mean that the modeling software is buggy. And then there are paragraphs like this one from the draft Addendum 4 to Amendment 6, which was proposed to address issues with their biological reference points. And again, this is editorial, but it does factor into my conclusion. Reading this paragraph made me honestly wonder what their internal culture must be like. The first sentence gave me hope, as I thought it indicated that they were thinking about the lack of prey, specifically Manhattan, needed for rebuilding the stocks. But my hopes were soon dashed. The second and third sentence, although technically factual, show a complete skew in reality. Both of these sentences credit Amendment 6 with success in meeting goals based on biological reference points that were derived from a system that appears in retrospect to be flawed. I mean, the whole object of Addendum 4 is to fix the reference points established in Amendment 6. The next sentence, regarding the significantly declining stocks and the subsequent call to action of this addendum, would certainly indicate this. So there seems to be a cultural disconnect in there somewhere. There are a lot of other items I came across regarding problems with the data gathering methods used in assessments, issues in estimating the harvesting of undersized fish, overlimits, the poaching of the EEZ, among others. But this video has already gone way longer than I wanted. So let me move on to my last topic, and that is MICO and how its impact might reveal itself amongst all this data. To me, MICO is the wild card in the Bass Stocks management game. Here's a quick refresher based on the available science. It's a progressive, incurable, and ultimately fatal disease. Its infection rate increases over time. Its mortality rate increases over time. 70% of the biomass is estimated to be infected, and the presence of the disease appears to be linked to water quality issues. While this is observation and not data, I can tell you that myco is real. I live on the Chesapeake Bay, and myself and other fishermen I know see it down here all the time. Some call the fish with advanced infection skeletors, my guess the name coming from that goofy Geico commercial. From the study I referenced earlier, this picture shows the four classifications assigned to the progression of the disease. The fish in the example are all around 18 to 20 inches, approximately four years old, and ready to join the coastal migratory SSB. And from the same study, this accompanying chart shows the progression and severity of the disease with age. Despite what science tells us about this disease, I found very little regarding its impact in any of the ASMFC documentation I've gone through. I did find one small paragraph that referenced a formula value for MICO, but it had no explanation of what, where, or why. But other than that, I haven't found anything. Maybe it's there somewhere, maybe it's not, but I couldn't find it. So I decided to do a little data analysis of my own. Please be patient because the video is almost over. Going back to this paragraph from a short while ago, which was summarizing biomass abundance, I noticed a sentence that indicated there was a small increase in 8 plus year abundance in 2011 due to the 2003 year class coming of age. Just for perspective, they make the distinction in stocks based on age 8 and above because age 8 is roughly the year that fish exceed the 28 inch size limit and become available for harvest. So for whatever number of juvenile fish the 2003 year class produced, due to the large percentage of fish infected with myco and the progression and associated mortality with age, as well as mortality by other means such as predation, it's reasonable to assume that there should be some level of reduction in that year class before maturing to age 
age 8. The real question is how large. Current science estimates slightly less than 50%, but they never seem to indicate what that time frame is. So I went back and looked at the 2003 year juvenile index. Total abundance got a pretty good kick in 2003 according to all three indexes. As that year class became age 1, they became accounted for with the abundance estimated at just shy of 166 million. I then looked at the table entry for the 2011 age 8, and the abundance estimate was 3,817,930 fish. So I figured what percentage of the 2003 year class, well technically 2004 age 1 year class, matured into 2011 age 8 class, and was somewhat surprised by the result. 2.3%. That's a much lower percentage than I expected. So my first thought was that Michael must be taking a big bite out of the stocks. So to get a better perspective, I ran the numbers for all year classes on record to see how the various year classes percolated into age 8, using the same method I just described. Again, I was surprised to see that the range ran from low to mid 3% for the early 80s year classes and decreased over time to the low 2%. According to this, for every 100 fish that make it to their first birthday, only two will see their eighth. So I ran the numbers for a different range this time. I was curious to see how many make it out of childhood and recruit to the SSB in their fourth year. The average was somewhere around 10%, with no revealing trend exhibited over time. To be honest, I can't say for sure what the significance of this is. It doesn't fit the common numbers used for juvenile survival rate, which are way higher. Perhaps the common survival rate percentages are based on the time from spawn to age 1, as I can't recall any time frame ever getting mentioned in conjunction with any of those statistics. I'll have to look into this at some point in the future, so I just don't know. All I did was connect the dots in the data to see if I could establish any trends, and it did. In the case of the age 1 to age 8 recruitment, when you consider the size of age 1 numbers, meaning around 100 million or more, 1% represents a lot of harvestable fish, specifically 1 million of them. So the roughly 1% decrease from the mid to late 80s to the present represents the loss of approximately 1 million age 8 fish a year, and that is significant. Is Myco the cause? I can't say because the answer to that is beyond my pay grade. As I presented information in this video, I tried not to be disrespectful to any of the stakeholders. This wasn't intended as a rec versus com thing or an ASMFC bashing, as I have no interest in this video generating letters from lawyers representing the ASMFC. But because the ASMFC is the regulatory body, then they do factor into my assessment of the health of the stocks, and they factor greatly. One of my greatest concerns moving forward is the way the resource has been managed. I've already covered the major issues, so I'll leave it at this. The ASMFC was happy to take credit for the rebuilding of the stocks, so by default, they have to take the blame for the decline. Actions have always spoken louder than words, and based on their actions and the current state of the fishery, their incessant assertions that the resource is not overfished nor is experience overfishing according to their biological reference points rings hollow. My other great concern is mycobacteriosis. We know about the disease, but determining its impact on the current and future stocks is difficult to ascertain, simply because a million fish could die in the ocean over the course of a year, and there is no way of detecting this or accounting for it. Census taking and tagging data are already woefully lacking sources of data, even for determining catch data and biomass abundance. So in effect, there is no real way to estimate its impact. It may be years before we fully understand the effect this disease has on the stocks, so until then, it remains the wild card in striped bass management. In the meantime, the ASMFC is hoping that the 2011 year class is going to bail them out. They have even been entertaining measures to preserve the 2011 year class, particularly the females, due to the serious decline of the female SSB and the fact that Amendment 6 factors female SSB in establishing biological reference points. So even though recent ASMFC assessment summaries claim we're not as bad as the 80s crash, which we aren't, at least by the current numbers, they're looking at the 2011 year class much the way they did the 82 year class in the rebuilding years. And as I said before, the mere fact that the ASMFC has brought the crash years into the conversation speaks volumes. I could go on about how I think the fishery should be managed and what improvements I would make in the methodologies used, but that would just be wasted breath. For me, the acid test is going to be what the fishery looks like after the 2011 year class matures into age 8 fish in 2019, 
and gets the target on its collective back. Will the assessment show good age eight recruitment? Don't know. Will Michael have an impact on age eight recruitment? Don't know. Will the ASMFC's biological reference points and maximum sustainable yield harvest them out of existence in a couple of years? Don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. So while I'm not going to use words like crash or crisis just yet, I do think the striped bass stocks have some serious problems, with the source of those problems being economical, ecological, and biological in nature. They have a bounty on their head and a bug in their gut, and the results are in plain sight for everybody to see. So for those of us who were fortunate enough to have fished for striped bass during the late 90s and early 2K, I hope you enjoyed the fantastic fishing and took lots of pictures, for we will never see its like again, not if the ASMFC has anything to say about it. Other than serving as a soapbox from which to voice my opinion, the real reason I made this video is to help those who want to understand the management issues but didn't really know where to start. Other than the summary narratives, making sense of the assessments, amendments, and addendums can be overwhelming. You've heard my opinions, now hopefully you've been motivated and equipped to do your own research and form your own opinions. And just to illustrate the size and scale, my opinion in two bucks will get you a ride on a subway. That's my view from the beach. So until next time, be well and catch him up.